A reading from the book of Genesis. God put Abraham to the test. He called to him, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son Isaac, your only one, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a burnt offering on a height that I will point out to you. Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took with him his son Isaac and two of his servants as well, and with the wood that he had cut for the burnt offering, set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham got sight of the place from afar. Then he said to his servants, both of you stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go on over yonder. We will worship and then come back to you. Thereupon Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two walked on together, Isaac spoke to his father Abraham. <coughs> father, he said, Yes, son, he replied. Isaac continued, Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Son, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the sheep for the burnt offering. Then the two continued going forward. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he tied up his son, Isaac, and put him on top of the wood on the altar. Then he reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the Lord's messenger called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Do not lay your hand on a boy, said the messenger. Do not do the least thing to him. I know now how devoted you are to God, since you did not withhold from me your own beloved son. As Abraham looked about, he spied a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the site Yahweh Yerim. Hence people now say, on a mountain, the Lord will see. Again, the Lord's messenger called to Abraham from heaven and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you acted as you did in not withholding from me your beloved son, I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants shall take possession of the gates of their enemies. And in your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall find blessing. All this because you obeyed my command. Abraham then returned to his servants and they set out together for Bathsheba, where Abraham made his home. Verbum Domini. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your kindness, because of your truth, why should the pagans say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. Whatever he wills, he does. Their idols are silver and gold, the handiwork of men. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but hear not. They have noses, but smell not. Their maker shall be like them, every one who trusts in them. The house of Israel trusts in the Lord. He is their help and their shield.
reconciling the world to himself in Christ and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia. Sancti Evangelii secundum Mateum. Gloria After entering a boat, Jesus made the crossing and came into his own town. And there people brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Courage, child, your sins are forgiven. At that, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, why do you harbor evil thoughts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your stretcher and go home. He rose and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were struck with awe and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Verbum Domini. We have witnesses of great faith in the readings today. We see that sometimes God tests us, as in the case of Abraham. Do we truly love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Abraham was put to the ultimate test when God told him, take your son Isaac, your only one whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him as a burnt offering on a height that I will point out to you. And as we heard, Abraham is obedient. As he takes Isaac and prepares to sacrifice him before the Lord stops him. And as our dear mother Angelica would say, I don't know anyone who would do that, including myself. The Lord is very demanding. But you see, if we don't trust him, we will never know what he wants of us. God did not intend to take that boy's life but he did push Abraham far enough to determine how much he loved God. How much do you love God? How far are you willing to go for him? In the Old Testament, these men and women were tried sorely. In your life too, the circumstances may not seem to be conducive to faith, but those are the circumstances of faith. Circumstances that exercise our faith are often vastly different from what we expect or would like. Just ask Abraham. And isn't that true? We're often inspired when we read sacred scripture, these men and women who went through tremendous trials like Abraham or Job. We read about the saints, again, who went, underwent tremendous trials of faith. That inspires us. But when something comes our way, it's the last thing we'd expect or want. But how often is it during those times that we do pray more fervently. We do pray more often. That's when we really have to trust, during a time of great trial in our lives or in the lives of those we love dearly. And because Abraham did believe God and he was obedient to what God had asked him to do, he is called the father of all who believe. This is also why Abraham is called our father in faith that we hear when we pray the Roman canon or the first Eucharistic prayer. Abraham, our father in faith. And the other great witnesses of faith that we see today are the friends of the paralytic in the gospel. They brought their friend to the Lord. They even overcame obstacles to do so, such as opening up the roof and lowering their friend down since the house was crowded with many people. And a very important line in today's gospel is this. When Jesus saw their faith, 
he said to the paralytic, courage, child, your sins are forgiven. It was because of the faith of these other men that the Lord healed the paralytic. And Jesus did far more than what they had expected or what they had desired. They had wanted him to heal this man's paralysis. But Jesus first healed him spiritually by forgiving him his sins, which is far greater. And then he healed him physically, and that was as a proof to show that he did have authority. He did have the power to forgive sins. And each of us, likewise, we need spiritual healing, and the Lord wants to heal us. We suffer from spiritual paralysis due to sin. That's why he gave us the sacrament of penance, of confession, to absolve us, to heal us, and to strengthen us just as he did that paralytic. And he also gave us the sacrament of the anointing of the sick to help strengthen us during those times of serious illness. And we're reminded in this gospel passage as well that this man could not go to Jesus on his own. He needed the help of those others. He needed their help and so do we. We all need help. We thank God for those who brought us to the Lord. Maybe it was our parents at baptism but not all of us, some of us come to faith later in life. But again, we didn't do it on our own. First of all, God initiated it. We did cooperate with his grace, but there was someone else involved or many others involved. Maybe it was someone who told us about the Lord, someone who told us about the Catholic faith. But who brought us to the Lord? We thank God for that gift. We all need help in coming to the Lord. And Saint Maria Goretti, like the men in the gospel today, was a good friend. And she even brought her murderer to the Lord through her prayers and through her forgiveness, which led to his conversion. Maria Gretti was born in 1890 in Italy, and she came from a family of tenant farmers. The Gerettis partnered with the Serenelli family in doing this work. When Maria was only 10 years old, her father became very ill and he died. And her mother then had to go out in the fields to do, the, to do a lot of the manual labor to help support the family. So Maria, in a sense, became like the mother of the family. She did a lot of the household duties that her mother used to do, taking care of the kids and cooking and cleaning. And as many are familiar with this story, Alessandro Serenelli, who was about nine years older than Maria, had become consumed by lust, and he made several advances toward Maria, but she absolutely refused, she resisted. And she sought to avoid him, as we know we're all called to do, to avoid the near occasion of sin, to avoid others who might lead us to sin. It said that when Maria made her first Holy Communion, the message that the priest gave the children was purity at all costs. And Maria took this to heart, at all costs. It was on July 5th, 1902, that members of the Goretti and the Serenelli family, they were out working in the fields. And in the afternoon, Alessandro went back to the house and what he did was sharpened a nine inch blade. And then he called to Maria to come to him and she refused. She said, what do you want? And he didn't tell her, he just demanded again. And when she refused again because he wouldn't tell her, he dragged her into the house. But of course, according to Alessandro himself and testimony, when Maria refused his lustful advances, she said, what are you doing? Do not touch me, it's a sin and you'll go to hell. As she resisted with all her might, he could not touch her, and he knew he couldn't touch her. He began to stab her repeatedly. And those out in the field could not hear her cries, but it did wake up her baby sister, because when Alessandro came into the house, Maria was outside, she was doing some mending and also looking after her little baby sister who was sleeping. Her cries did wake up her sister, and that drew the attention of those working outside. But Alessandro's father and Maria's mother found Maria, and shortly at, this was shortly after the attack, and she was taken to the hospital. And a priest was called to give her viaticum as she was dying, and he asked her if she forgave the young man who had stabbed her. She said, yes, I too, for the love of Jesus, forgive him, and I want him to be with me in paradise. May God forgive him because I already have forgiven him and she was only 11 years old when she died. And as for Alessandro, of course, he was arrested and sent to prison, and he spent eight years showing no sign of remorse or repentance. Eight years, his soul was hardened, his heart was hardened, and he must have been miserable. 
But after about eight years, he had a dream and he saw Maria in a field of flowers and she was handing him um, some lilies. This led to his conversion. It was shortly after this that he wrote to the bishop and he begged God's pardon and his mercy, especially for the grave sin that he had committed. And later, after he would be released from prison, he went to visit Maria's mother and he tearfully begged for her forgiveness as well. And Maria Gretti's mother told him that she could hardly refuse to forgive him when Maria had been so willing to forgive. So Maria is a great example, Maria Gretti, of one who forgives of one who is pure of heart, and again, as we saw in the gospel, one who brings others to Jesus. And purity is so needed in our world today, which is saturated with impurity. So we ask for Maria's prayers today, that we might grow in purity of heart, that we might grow in our faith, and like she and the men in the gospel, we might always seek to bring others closer to the Lord.